Now, I'm going to tell you what, as, as uh, Christ followers, we, we believe that uh, if you're a Christ follower, you've got the Holy Spirit of God living in you. That's a biblical truth. And which, by the way, we need to just we need to live on these biblical truths. Don't leave them in the book. God didn't write them for them to be left in the book. Okay, He wants them in your heart to make a difference in your life, for real. So, but where I was going with all that is, as if we believe we, what we believe is that if you're a Christ follower, the Holy Spirit is living in you. But I'm just going to tell you, the Holy Spirit is in this room today. So, if it's okay with you, we're just going to shut up. We're going to get out of His way and let Him work, because He ain't here for nothing. You know, he chose to come visit with us today, and so we're just going to let him work. But thank you so much for being here. Uh, what a privilege to have you here today, and I mean that from the very bottom of my heart. Uh, Cindy and I just love uh, serving alongside you guys. We're in our last uh, week of the series called uh, The Grave Robber, and uh, the, the subtitle is How Jesus Can Make Your Impossible Possible. And we've been loosely basing this on Mark Batterson's book called The Grave Robber. If you don't have a copy of it, you'll want to pick it up because basically I hadn't been preaching much that's in the book other than just a few quotes. Um, the book's just full of stuff to just encourage you and to just literally let you know that Jesus can make your impossible possible. And a lot of you have been living in the impossible for so long, you don't know what that means. You don't know what it looks like to step into the possible, but guess what? Jesus will show you. He can make that happen. And basically, we've been looking at the book of John. We've been looking at the seven miraculous signs that John records in there that um, basically the seven miracles that Jesus performed that are in there. And what we've been telling ourselves each week is these are not just simply things that Jesus did 2,000 years ago. This is stuff Jesus does today. He wants to do it in your life today. Miracles are not something that ended at the book of Acts. Miracles happen right now. Miracles happen today. And so that's what we believe and that's where we're going. I love the way John does this. John calls them signs because that's what they are. They're actually signposts that point us to that supernatural power behind the miracle. And that power is the amazing power of God. That's where it comes from. That's where it comes from. And so far, uh, as the, the bumper was showing you, we've been looking at Jesus as the winemaker, uh, the choreographer, the rule breaker, Lord Algebra, the water walker, the eye opener. And today we're going to close it out by looking at the grave robber. Now, if you'll go ahead and open up your uh, sermon notes there, as we've done each sermon, we have talked about the place, give you a little historical background, a little cultural background about what's going on. And uh, we're in the book of John, and we're in chapter 11. And if you want to go to your, uh, if you have the YouVersion app on your phone, you can go there and at the bottom of, the, the bottom of your page there in your uh, worship guide, the uh, password for the Wi-Fi is on there. It's called, it's Be Contagious, all lowercase, if you want to plug into the Wi-Fi. But, uh, so you can go on there and all the sermon notes are there. Everything's there for you. Our production team does a great job each week of pulling that together for you. So we're in the book of John, chapter 11. And... Uh, Here's the, pl here's the scene. Here's, let's set this thing up. The scene is a little village of Bethany. Bethany is about two miles east of Jerusalem, just over the Mount of Olives. Okay, it's just right outside the Mount of Olives there. It's about two miles uh, from there. And uh, Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus live there. Now, we know a pretty good bit about Mary and Martha because we've met them before in Scripture. Don't know a whole lot about Lazarus, um, but uh, we do know from this story that uh, Lazarus is sick, very sick, on his deathbed. And uh, we know that the girls, his sisters, send um, Jesus a note telling him that Lazarus is deathly sick because they know he'll do something about it. They know that uh, if we tell Jesus that Lazarus is sick and about to die, he's going to come heal Lazarus. They, that's what they're thinking in their head, all right? And as I said, we don't know a lot about Lazarus other than the fact that we do know that uh, Scripture says that Lazarus is somebody that Jesus loved. Now, the great thing about that is that you are Lazarus. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. So starting right now, I want you to think, whenever you hear Lazarus, I want you to think your name in there. Okay? Put your name in there. So, Jesus is somewhere away. We're not exactly sure where. There's some speculation, but who cares? He's away, 
all right? And uh, when he gets the message, he tells the, the, uh, his, his disciples who know he loves Lazarus, he says, well, you know, this sickness he's got is not going to end in death. But then we find out 10 verses later that, and Jesus says it out of his own mouth, that Lazarus has died, all right? But Jesus decides to stay another couple of days where he is. Now, that's just totally confusing. If he loves this guy, why didn't he go there? Okay? So, bottom line is, Lazarus dies. Now, in accordance with the local customs and Middle Eastern customs, here's the way this thing rolls. Okay? Uh, Lazarus would have been buried within 24 hours of when he died. All right? And they bury him in caves. And in the cave, there would be a little hollowed out place in the side where they would put his body and... That's where it would lay. And the body would look kind of like a mummy. What they do is they wrap, uh, they put the legs together and they wrap linen. Uh, they tie the, the ankles together with linen cloth. Then they tie the arms down beside them like this with linen cloth. And then they pile on a whole bunch of spices and stuff. Now, that's not to preserve them. That's so they, so they don't stink so bad. Okay? Because it gets just rank. You know, it's just bad. And so they, then they, so they do that and then they wrap the whole body in linen and then they pack a whole bunch of stuff around the head, and they wrap the head. And uh, historians said that the head was uh, usually about a foot wide by the time they got through wrapping everything. Okay? So basically what you have here is Lazarus is a mummy. Okay? Except for Egyptians, they did that 40-day thing where they took all their guts out, put them in a little bowl and all that kind of thing. They didn't do that. They just wrapped them up. 24 hours, you're in the grave, in the cave. Okay? So keep that in your head. And... Uh, then, then they roll a stone over the front of the cave, and that's to keep out the stray animals and to keep in the stink. Okay? If you have smelled a dead deer on the side of the road, you can imagine what a dead body would smell like. Uh, so, and, and here's the plan. A lot of us didn't realize this. And it, you may not realize this. The whole plan was a year later, what the family would do is go back to the grave, take the stone off, go in and collect the bones by that time, put them in a little tiny box, and, and then they would hollow out another space inside the cave just big enough for that little bone box to go in, and that's what they would do, okay? And so that's, that's how they would do it. But here's the question. If Jesus loved him, how come he didn't go? How come he didn't just, he could have just said, boom, you're healed. Remember, we talked about that before. He's the choreographer. He, he choreographs time and space. He makes the gospel dance happen. He healed a, a Roman official's son from 20 miles away. Why couldn't he just, boom, heal Lazarus? Let's talk about that, okay? Let's talk. He could, exactly, he could. He stayed for two reasons, though, and this comes out in the Scripture. He stayed, one, to bring glory to God, and because he loved the family. Now, you say, well, wait a minute, if he loved the family, how come he didn't go feed them? Well, let's, you, you hold that thought right there. Let's talk about that a little bit. One of the things I want us to understand is that, and some people will, will argue with me on this, that God's glory and his love for you are not enemies. God can bring glory to himself and love you immensely at the same time, Okay? So we need to reject the temptation to sort of pit those two against each other because the bottom line is this. God's glory is displayed mainly in his extravagant love for each of us. That's how he gets glory, when he just loves you. He just loves you. So let's move on, though. By the time Jesus gets there, uh, the funeral's over. Jesus is four days late, okay? By that time, the potato salad's gone. The Kentucky Fried Chicken's gone. Might be a little cornbread left. Other than that, pfft, he gone. Four days late. Now, I was late to a funeral one time. I had to sit on the back row. He's late four days late. Okay? Um, so, but here's the thing I want you to understand. The timing here is not an accident. Listen to this just real carefully. This is so critical. Four days, okay? Jewish uh, superstition said that the soul of a person hovered over the body for three days. So Jesus waited long enough for the superstitious Jews to not be able to say, well, his soul was still floating around, so it jumped back in him. You with me? Four days is very important. So uh, basically what they say is it's not until the third day that that, or after the third day that the Jews considered death to be irreversible. 
So that's very important for us to stand. So let's go back to the scene. Jesus shows up with his boys and his tribe, and they're coming on down. Martha comes out and meets him and just, la just not really lamb blasts him, but Martha just gives him a piece of her mind. All right? And she had called Jesus. Jesus could have fixed Lazarus, but he didn't come. He waited. But here's the thing I want you to understand, and we misread this a lot of times in this passage. Her disappointment actually shows her total confidence in who Jesus is. And I want you to understand, in the midst of your disappointment, you can know exactly who Jesus is. She knew beyond a shadow of doubt that Jesus could have done something if he'd been there. But now he's four days late. So she doesn't know. But then she says this great line, and I love what she says. Uh, she says, I, you know, I don't know what you can do now, but I know you can do whatever you want to do. Guys, that's where we need to put Jesus a lot of times. When our plans fall apart and life falls apart on us and we're like blaming God and everybody else, what we need to say is, look, I don't know what you can do now, but I do know you can do what you can do because you're Jesus. Okay? So it just doesn't get any bigger than this. All through the book of John, uh, John's been recording these amazing signs and miracles that Jesus performed, like we said, turning the water into wine, healing the Roman official's son, restoring a cripple, feeding 5,000 people, walking on water, sp spitting and making a little mud pie, putting on a guy's eyes who had never seen before in his whole life. He'd been blind since birth, and then, then he could see. Okay? Um, but right here, this is like the, this is like the, the apex. This is like the, 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 the ultimate miracle of his earthly ministry. He raises somebody from the dead and not just somebody that just passed away. Okay? This is somebody whose body had already begun to decay and to, to you know, putrefy is I guess the word I'm thinking. You may not realize this and, and I didn't know this until my, my niece was studying in her, one of her master's things. She was studying forensic anthropology. I don't know what that means. I can't spell it. Uh, but it has something to do with what you see on TV. She studied at a place in uh, Knoxville called the Body Farm. Anybody ever heard of it? The Body Farm. The Body Farm is a place where they take dead people and put them, just lay them out, and they study how quickly they decay. Thank you very much. And they pick the little bugs out to see which bugs eat in what part, and, and that's how they know, you know, CSI kind of junk, you know, I don't know. I, I personally wouldn't want to work there. You know, after working there, I could not in good conscience go eat a bowl of spaghetti. I know that, okay? It just wouldn't happen. It just would not happen. But so here's my point. Lazarus been in a body farm. And uh, so let's pick the story up right there because John gives us this amazing detail uh, so let's start in, and I'm kind of skipping around just a little bit, so bear with me if you don't want to read from your uh, pad or your Bible, you can read off of here. But I'm reading from the uh, uh, Christian Standard Version. And so let's pick it up right there, starting at verse 21. All right? So, um, and, and I'm going to call this the confusion because there's some confusion going on here. There, there, Martha's confused, Mary's confused, the townspeople are confused, the disciples are confused, everybody confused. Okay, so let's see, what, let's see what Jesus says. Start at verse 21. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Yet I know now that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Now Jesus tells her one of those pastoral things. Your brother's going to rise again. Okay? And uh, then Martha said, I know that he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. So, and then Mary, we find out later on, Mary comes up and says the same thing because basically what happens is Martha has her little uh, discussion with Jesus. Then she runs back to the house and gets Mary. Mary comes and gives Jesus the same spiel, all right? But we learn from Mary it, in verse 32, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not die. So what you got to understand is for these two sisters from Bethany, the grief is raw. The grief is totally raw. Some of, you, some of you are experiencing grief that is so raw. And what you have to understand, too, most of us think that we only experience grief when somebody dies. That's wrong. You experience grief whenever you lose anything. 
If you lose a job, you're experiencing grief. If you lose your health, you're experiencing grief. If you lose a dog, you're experiencing grief. Whatever you lose, you, you, know, um, you, know, you experience grief. You go through those things. And, but Martha and those, they were in this intense grief. But Martha wanted Jesus to know that she still trusted him. She still had confidence in him. And that's what I want us to talk about today. If, in the middle of your storm, if, you're, if, if everything around you smells like death, have confidence in Jesus. Quit putting your confidence in everything else. Why is it we look to everything else to put our confidence in except Jesus? I mean, my Lord, some of us worship them women on the view. Don't throw nothing. Don't throw no maters at me. All right? I don't, I don't know what you think, but I mean, we, some of us, that's where we get our stuff at. Okay? Um, so we, we go everywhere else, but we put our confidence in Him. And here's the thing. We learn this later on from, in, in some verses later on. Martha wasn't trying to persuade Jesus to raise Lazarus from the dead. We find that out later on in the verses. Okay? What she was saying was she's affirming her faith in her ongoing trust in what Jesus was about. And that's what we need to do, man. When life smells like death, we need to put our trust and affirm our trust in Jesus and what he is about, not what death and not what the circumstances are about. That's what we need to do. And Jesus comes up with this one statement, amazingly profound, that, that is going to have implications for the whole rest of the thing. Your brother will rise again. Now, uh, most of the Jews, except for the Sadducees, uh, believed in life after death. Okay? So Martha was a devout Jewish, uh, Jewess. Uh, uh, she was a good Jewish girl. Okay? She was a good Jewish girl. So... Um, she knew the Old Testament. She understands that God's promise that, that life is not all there is and there's something greater after death. But look, guys, listen, Jesus is talking about something so much bigger and so much more remarkable. It's just going to blow her head, slap off, kind of that thing like, you know? It's just going to do it. So that's the confusion. There's this ball of confusion there that's going on. So let's look at the next part I call the confession, uh, verses 25 and 27. So let's look at that. Then Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this? Okay? So, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't say, I can, <coughs> excuse me, I can resurrect people and I have life. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Listen, please understand me when I say this. Our hope is not in an event, meaning the resurrection. Our hope is in a person, Jesus Christ. A lot of us go through life with misplaced hope. We put our hope in everything but Jesus. Okay? He, he is our hope. And, and the greatest thing about this, nothing can stop him from giving life because he just doesn't have life. He is life. He is life. You know, and that's one of the ways he's different from you and I. You and I have a life. Okay? Well, some of you say, I ain't got no life. <laughs> you know, I ain't got a life. But technically, you do have a life. Okay? You have a life. He is life. All right? You can lose your life, but Jesus can never, ever, cannot, and will not lose his life. He's going to lay it down. But his resurrection is proof that death could not take that life from him. And so Jesus makes a promise to her that goes way beyond what he's doing for Lazarus. He says, look, anybody that believes, even though they die physically, it's going to live forever. And I love the way he does this. It almost sounds like a play on words when he does it. But he says it in two different ways, so listen carefully. First of all, he says, the one who believes in me, even if they die, they will live. In other words, if the person who has put their complete faith and trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ, after they die, they're going to experience eternal life with him, that same new and eternal life that Jesus promised. 
And then the second way he says it is, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. And what that means is, guys, that abundant life that, you know, John 10, 10 says, I came, you might have life and have it abundantly, fully, hilariously, overflowing. That life starts the moment you become a Christ follower. Too many of us become Christ followers and spend the rest of our life in, in the, the rut thinking, oh, I'm going to have eternal life without. Folks, you done missed out on a whole bunch of good life. Quit waiting until you die to start having a good life. Jesus died for you to start having a good life right now. Right now. And the good life is, some of you, some of us think that the good life is like, no, that's not what he's calling you to. You should have been out there with us yesterday. Man, we had people going on all over the place. We had the streets blocked off. We had Tower of Power. If you don't know who that is, God bless you. We had Tower of Power playing on the radio, on the, the pumped up system, and it was happening, and it was going, and people was having fun and laughing. That's Jesus. That's what he wants us to do. Quit living like you're living in life in a funeral. One of my favorite favorite uh, um, psychotherapist says it like this. Get over it. <laughs> this is life, man. This is fun stuff. This is why he called us. This is what we do. So, and listen, death is just going to be that little momentary, uh, it's like you just change the channel. You're here one minute, you're in heaven with him the next. And I don't, you, but I don't know about you, but that, I mean, I ain't wishing to go quick. I got a lot of roads my motorcycle needs to ride between now and then. But, you know, I'm kind of thinking that's going to be pretty sweet. You know, I'm just what I'm thinking. I don't know. But we're going to move immediately in the blink of an eye from this earthly scene to the heavenly scene. And so in that sense, we're never going to die. Even if you die, even if this old earth suit dies, and stops, you're never going to stop. You're going to keep going. That real life, that abundant life is never going to end. But I want you to notice something here. There's a condition that goes along with this confession. Look what he says. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes, say believe, believe, in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Okay, and listen, that's the question he's asking you right now. You can know all this stuff in this book. You can quote this book. You realize the devil can quote this book. There are a lot of people who can quote this book. But do you believe what's in this book? Do you read what you believe or do you believe what you read? A lot of us read this to justify anything we want to justify. That's reading what you believe. Or do you believe what you read? What it says goes. Okay. So, do you believe? And he's saying, do you believe that? And that's, he's not only asking Martha that, he's asking me and you that today. Are you playing games or do you really believe this stuff? Do you really believe it? And if it does, guys, it's got to make a difference in your life. Do you really believe this? Do you really? And listen, it doesn't, Jesus is so clear here. It doesn't require, you know, uh, religious ceremonies or hard work or giving a bunch of money. All that's required to have this eternal life is to put your whole faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You say, well, boy, I have trust issues. No, you don't. You're sitting in a chair. Did you pick that chair up and go, I ain't sure if this thing, oh, look at there, there's a bottle in there. I ain't sure if this thing's going to hold me up or not. I don't know if I can trust this thing or not. What about them legs? I don't know about that. No, you dropped your, twop, your bottom in a chair. You put it right in a chair. And you didn't think a thing about it. Why is it that you, that you treat Jesus different from a chair? Jesus is better than a chair. And you don't trust, you don't, you don't have to spend all that issue with a chair, but you do with Jesus. You just have to, to cherry pick everything Jesus says. Oh, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if he blew. 
just sit on Jesus. Just put your full weight on him. I don't know many of you that are sitting there going, well, I can't really put my whole weight in this chair. I'm afraid it's going to come out from under me. You know, no, you just dropped it in there. So, literally speaking, just drop it in Jesus' lap. Quit trying to hold yourself up out of the chair. Okay? Martha got it. She knew exactly. Man, she got it right off the bat. When Jesus said if she believed, she said, yes, Lord. Notice what she said. Lord. Lord. That is when you make somebody Lord of your life. That's when you say, Jesus, I ain't got a clue where I'm going. I thought I knew where I was going, but I'm as lost as a ball in high weeds. I'm going to have to trust you that you have your, my best interest at heart. So take over my life. That's when he becomes Lord. Martha got it. She said, yes, Lord. I know you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And that's what he's saying to us. Do you believe this? And are you going to say, yes, Lord, I know you are Jesus the Christ that died for me, that forgave me of my sin, that, was, that took those stripes so that I could be healed. She knew who he was. He was that unique rescuer. Back in our... Uh, our vacation Bible school, one of, the, one of the things we talk about is Jesus rescues. Guys, that's not just for children. That's it. Jesus rescues. I've told you before, I was swimming up at, at uh, Kings Mountain State Park when I was about five or six years old, and my brother and I were, were playing with a ball out in the, in the, the uh, lake there, and it went over in these bulrush, these reeds over there, so I swam over to get it, and when I kicked back up, uh, Cotton mouth water moccasin bit me on the top of the foot. Worst pain ever shot through my life. But here's the thing, and stay with me on this. Things that I remember in my head, I remember that green water coming up, and I remember watching that green water and going underwater like that. And then I went out. I don't remember anything after that. But I remember waking up, coming out of the lake, and this, this lifeguard, I remember it to this day, he had blonde hair, and uh, he looked a lot like Jeff Chandler. <laughs> you know, don't, y'all don't know Jeff Chandler. He's an old movie star. So anyway, he, looked, he was a handsome guy, all right? But I remember him holding me like this, and I looked up, and he looked down. He said, it's okay, I've got you. You're going to be all right. That is what Jesus did for you. When you got bit by Satan the snake, sin and death was taking you underwater, and some of you are watching that green water go up, and you pass out, and you think that's all there is, and Jesus is that lifeguard who's saying, it's okay, I've got you. He's the one that comes in the water and gets you. He's the one that comes in the, in the depth of who you are in your sin, in your death, in all the mess that we create. He steps into that, picks you up, and my prayer is that today you look up and see him holding you, and he looks down at you and say, it's okay, I got you, you're going to be all right. And I don't want you to get bit by no cotton mouth. It don't feel good. Okay? It don't feel good. So that's the condition. Now let's look at the compassion. These are some of the most interesting verses in Scripture right here. And there's a lot of ink been spilt over all this thing. But we're just going to shoot straight with it. The next few verses talk about the way Jesus responds to their sorrow. So let's look at verse 33. When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying... Uh, by the way, you know they had paid criers back then? Uh, that was your gig, you know. What do you do for a living? I cry at people's funeral. Oh, great. Good. Okay. How much you make doing that? You get overtime? I don't know. How does that work? What's your resume look like? Anyway, so I'm sure a lot of these guys were crying, getting paid for it. <laughs> How much can I You know. But anyway, look what it says. After he saw them crying, he was angry in his spirit and deeply moved. Where have you put him, he asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, look how much he loved them. But some of them said, well, couldn't he open the blind man's eyes? Couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept this man from dying? Listen, the most remarkable part of this thing is that Jesus is going to do something about their suffering. There ain't no doubt. He's going to do it. But before he fixes their problem, he joins their pain. And before he exiles their grief, he enters their grief. You know, and listen, we can't be afraid to, to enter somebody else's grief. One of the first things we do is, is when we meet somebody who's grieving, we try to smooth it over. I got a book back there that says 30 things you don't say to people who are grieving. 
And we all need to read that because we all say all 30, 30 of them and add five more. Okay? But we just, we, we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to shy away from people who are uncomfortable like that. We, you know, out of love, just like Jesus, we need to just sit down with them and just listen. I remember going to, um, to a lady's house whose husband had passed away. And she was there by herself. And so I just sat with her. And it really was about two hours. And in that two hours, I might have got in five words. I did get in some banana pudding. I made sure of that. But I got in about five words. And when we got through, she said, thank you so much for talking to me. What you said just meant so much. You know, and I didn't say nothing. She just needed somebody just to listen to her. Okay, sometimes people just want you to listen. Okay. And that's what, that's what they're doing here. And so my suggestion would be pray for, a, pray for a heart that breaks over the suffering of people, other people, just like Jesus. But Jesus was gripped with emotion here. Two emotions. First of all, that word angry. He said he got angry in his spirit. That means agitated. That means moved, deeply disturbed within. Basically, he's groaning in his spirit. He groans with this understanding and this feeling and compassion not only for Mary and Martha but for anybody who is, is hurting and suffering. And guys, listen, he is, he is angry right now at your suffering and your hurt and your, 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 your situation. He's angry in his spirit over that right now. Okay? For anybody who's hurting and suffering. And he, it says he's actually feeling their misery. Okay? He's sympathetic and he's empathetic. And he was disturbed, he was agitated at this whole scene of sorrow and death and the, just the whole circus going on there. And then the next, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Now what you don't understand here is that, most of the times we don't understand, is that that word wept in the, in the Greek means Jesus lost it. I mean, he was blubbering and blowing snot like my grandmama used to say, you know? Y'all can laugh at that. Okay, it's okay. It's a y'all like, oh, he just said it's not in church. Okay, it's okay. But he was he had lost it, man. He had lost it. And why was he crying? What was he crying about? He was crying in love over, over death itself, over human pain and sorrow and suffering. Listen, guys, man, you were not made for sin and death. You were made for, for righteousness and life and you were made to have an intimate personal relationship with God. And with Adam and Eve, that all the earth fell, everything fell, humans fell, uh, your, your you know, sickness entered the earth, work entered the earth, thank you Adam and Eve. Uh, hurricanes and tornadoes entered, everything happened during that time. We were made for that personal intimate relationship with God. And I think Jesus is just, just crying over that broken relationship through, through centuries. I think it's just a culmination of that. So look at his command now, the next few verses. Verse 38 through 44. And I want you to notice something here. At the beginning of this scene, we find Mary and Martha and the whole crowd, and they're showing or they're expressing conditional belief in the power of Jesus. If you had been here, then. If, then. Okay? All right. They believe he could have done something if Lazarus had still been alive, but death came along and intervened, and they thought death was, was irreversible at this point. But boy, little did they know, little did they know that what they were talking about and what was about to happen is, is just totally overcome by God's power. So look at verse 38. Then Jesus, angry again in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and the stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said, uh, Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, he's already decaying. Some of your translations say he stinks. Uh, it's been four days. So he said, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now notice what he said. He didn't say you'd see your, your brother rise again. He said you would see the glory of God. All right? So they removed the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes, and he praised to God. Father, thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this so that they can believe you sent me. That's one of those little error prayers. You know, sometimes Jesus prays for two or three hours. That's probably two or three seconds. Listen, it's okay for you to do that too. 
it's okay for you to shoot up some error prayers like that. Okay? After this, he shouted in a loud voice. This is important. Very few times does John mention the volume of somebody's voice. But Jesus shouted! I feel better. God, that felt good. Can I do that again? That's my old band director voice coming out, Phoebe. <laughs> uh, but Jesus shouted in a loud voice. And uh, he says, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips, with his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. I love the way that Veggie Tales and uh, Mark Batterson describe this. Remember now, he's bound hand and foot, and he's bound like this. So it, like, it wasn't like he walked out. Lazarus basically kind of hopped out. Can you picture that scene? He's like hopping, you know. And probably at every wedding reception after that, when the band was playing, somebody was hollering to Lazarus, Hey, Lazarus, do the Lazarus! <laughs> you know? He hopped out. He hopped out. I got it from VeggieTales, baby. It's okay. <laughs> but here's the thing. So, uh, loose him and let him go. So, it, so Jesus stands before... Get this picture. Jesus is standing in... in front of the grave and he says move the stone and listen Martha really is struggling here to look past the circumstance to see the glory of God and guys don't we all do that don't we all see our circumstances as bigger than God you take all your, your troubles you stack them up next to God see who's bigger the cross is bigger than any of those okay we need to look at the glory of God, not the circumstance. Listen, Jesus' voice is stronger than anything you could go through. Jesus' voice is stronger than your situation's ever going to be. So he cries out in a loud voice. He yells in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And notice he called him by name. I love what St. Augustine says here, a quote from St. Augustine. Jesus had to call Lazarus out by name because if he hadn't, all the dead would have come out of their graves. Dude, I'd love to see that. <laughs> Sweet. Be like zombie apocalypse, you know, the walking dead. You know, all that kind of thing. So Jesus gave him the next command. After he says, Lazarus, come out, the next command that he gave is this. Loose him and let him go. In other words, unwrap him. And we know, listen, the power that Jesus had and had just used to raise him from the dead, he could have very easily just looked at those, that stuff and just melted it right off of him, okay? But he didn't. What did he do? He invited other people to be a part of his miracle. Jesus is inviting you to be a part of his miracle. You were a part of his miracle yesterday in Carnegie Estates. You were a part of it. Seven years ago, I sat in front of a house over there. And y'all think I cry a lot, but I don't. But I was crying because God had called us to plant a church in Carnegie Estates. And when I was over there yesterday, I could not control myself. You were part of a miracle that God's working with Outbreak Church. Yesterday. He invites us to be a part of that. Jesus invited people to be a part of unwrapping Lazarus and, and his, his amazing work was finished, but Lazarus needed that personal touch. Listen, there's people around you that are experiencing a miracle, but they just need a personal touch from you. Not that you're the one doing the miracle, but sometimes it just helps to have somebody there, right? So, but look at what happened here. Jesus was and still is the giver of life. He is life. And hear me on this. Jesus brings a second life to anybody who listens to him. Anybody, Scripture says that before Christ we were dead in our sins and trespasses. Okay? So before Christ you are dead. You're as dead as Lazarus. You stink just as much as he did. You don't even know it. Okay? Okay? So, Jesus doesn't just create like instant. 
the moment you accept Christ, you become a Christ follower. The Holy Spirit moves in you. But some of us still have some straggling pieces of that old grave cloth on us. Some of you are walking around as a Christ follower, still, still dragging some of your linen with you. What's your linen? Some of you, it's a failed relationship. Some of you, it's what you did a long time ago. Some of you, it's this, that, and the other. Some of you, it's, a, it's, it's whatever it is. It's different for everybody. Only the Holy Spirit can tell you what your rap is, okay? But every one of us still have some rap on us, okay? And Jesus says, loosen and let him go. When are you going to just get rid of that? And some of us need some help getting rid of that, you know? I had a rap, of, uh, part, part of my rap was anger and rage and bitterness. Now, I've told you this before. I could go from, from this, from just, just a, a, a mild confrontation to smashing your face in, boom, zero to 60 in 1.2 seconds. I tore down more doors. I knocked more, more walls, and I'm not proud of it. I'm just telling you. That's who I was. I had a problem with anger and rage. And I had to go get help for that. I realized finally that I needed help for that. So I went to literally a program called Celebrate Recovery, which is a 12-step program. People say, well, you weren't a, you weren't a drug addict. No, I was, a, I was a, an anger addict. Okay? Let me just give you a hint right off the bat. Christian 12-step programs are not just for people who are drug addicts or alcoholics. You may be a porn addict. You may be a sex addict. You may be a, an, an anger addict. You may be a food addict. You may be whatever. That's for you, okay? And that helped me. That's some of the raps. And i never forget a good friend of mine at Myrtle Beach Community Church gently, and this is figuratively, unwrapping me, unwrapping me ever so gently because he realized some of those raps I remember when I had my motorcycle accident and, and we would wrap this arm here and when they would wrap it, you know, it would hurt and stuff would come off with it and all this kind of stuff because he knew my anger was going to hurt and it was going to hurt for me to be cleansed of that but once I was cleansed from that, and let me tell you something too. One of the things when I had my motorcycle wreck, and I'm not going to belabor this point but it's important, I had no skin left on the back of this arm. It was just raw um, nerves and muscle back here. And I had to go through a thing called debreeding, which, and you know, uh, debreeding. I'd, I'd sit in a tub of, of water, a stainless steel tub of water at the hospital, and I think it was about 140 degrees or something like that, and they would take a scalpel and they would scrape over that. That sounds horrible. It was horrible. I'm going to tell you it was horrible. I had to have people from our church come and stand there and, and keep my focus. And I remember some of those godly people uh, doing that. Uh, and, and they wouldn't give me any pain medication. But here's the thing. I never forget the doctor saying, the healing only starts when the blood starts flowing. That'll preach. The healing's only going to start for some of you when you recognize that Jesus' blood has already started flowing for you. And I'm going to tell you what, if you look at the back of my arm right now, you can't see any, any nothing back there. That skin totally regenerated itself without skin grafts or anything. Okay? God wants to regenerate you. Some of us are looking for spiritual skin grafts when Jesus says, I'm just going to create you brand new. I'm going to create you brand new. So that's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do. So here's my question for us, man. What, what, what's, God, what's God calling you today to do? What is he calling you today to do? He's, I think he's calling you to do one of two things that we've talked about today. One, he's either calling you out of your grave. In other words, you're not a Christ follower yet. You're still dead in your sin. He is calling you out. Listen, I love that line on there. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. Okay, So you are either still in your grave and he's calling you out of your grave or you are in your grave clothes and he's calling you to unwrap. What's he doing? And here's what I want you to think about. 
He said, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. I want you to put your name in, take out Lazarus, put your name in there. Scott, come out. Scott, come out. Ron, come out. Shane, come out. Corey, come out. Come out. What is he telling you to come out of? He's calling you out of something right now. Do what he's telling you to do. Do what he's telling you to do. Let's just go ahead. God, the Holy Spirit's in his place. Let's just get up and let's just sing. Let's allow the Holy Spirit. Whatever you need prayer for, we're going to pray for you today. If you want to say, he's calling me out of my grave, we're going to rejoice with you in that, just like all those people around that grave did. We're going to help unwrap you gently, and we're going to just do this. And it, it, some of you may say, "Just I just got some stuff sticking on me that I need to get off. Will you help me get it off? There's going to be people all around you. Uh, Eddie's going to be over here. Jim's back there. Dale's back there. Um, Daryl's back there uh, and who else we got uh, Cynthia's right here, Cindy's over here what, whoever you, whatever you need to do the Holy Spirit's calling you right now He's calling you out of your grave He's calling you out of your grave clothes let's do that right now Holy Spirit, God Almighty King of Kings and Lord of Lords we praise you then you call us by name and you call us out of our death you call us out of our grave you call us out of those old rotten grave clothes help us to have the courage to step out and to step up and to hear you Give people courage to do what they need to do today. In Jesus' name I pray. I mean, I don't know what God's telling you to do, but you do it and don't hold back. Lazarus didn't lay in that grave and say, I think I'll do it next week. Uh-uh. He did it right then. He came out right then. He came out as he was, just as he was, immediately, without any questions. Quit giving questions and start stepping out of your grave right now. In Jesus' name, amen.